So let's start with a, just a really broad question. Why is this virus different? So there, there are two components to it. It's why is it different and when is it happening? Because both of those are critical. So this is a new virus that we've never before seen on this earth. So the bottom line is everything we're saying about what could happen, what will happen, it's conjecture because we don't have any data. Nobody has followed it before. So it is a coronavirus. About a third of colds are coronavirus. Um, but this is one that seems to be more aggressive and easier to spread. What really worries us as docs is that for several weeks, you can have mild to no symptoms and potentially still spread the virus. So from a mass infection basis, it's real. Then the other is it's happening in the middle of flu and cold season. So our ERs and our hospitals are full. So we don't have the infrastructure to deal with a very large load of patients that can come from this. So both of those together are kind of a perfect storm. So you said a third of colds are coronavirus. Can you say more about that? So the common cold is a coronavirus. And by the way, we've been trying to make a vaccine for the common cold for several decades and it hasn't worked. So that's why you know saying we're going to have a vaccine very soon to, is not necessarily to me accurate. Um, but yeah, this is a new type of coronavirus that we haven't seen before that appears to come from a bat to another animal to humans. And so its behavior, while we can guess, we just don't know. So for example, the people who have a mild infection, when they get better a year later, can they get it again? We don't know that answer yet. So something that we do hear people say, including the president who, tweet today, who tweeted today about it, is that a lot more people get the flu and die from the flu every year. So what is right and wrong about that argument? It, it, it's a cogent argument. I mean, it's real. So, you know, already there are anywhere from 25 to 30,000 people in the United States have died of the flu. Um, you know, what's interesting here is that because of the flu, every emergency room and hospital beds are full. And so when you add on to it, this virus, we're going to have thousands of people that we could have potentially saved with medical supportive care that we're not going to be able to treat because our infrastructure can't handle it. So if this weren't flu season, it'd be uh, one argument, it'd be a lot easier to handle. The second is, is we have vaccines for the flu, we have medicines for the flu, and we know the flu will temper out historically around May. We don't know what will happen with this virus going over time. There's no vaccines, and as of yet, there are no medications, although there are some on the horizon. So it seems like with the flu or the cold, you could be in a room with people that have it and may not necessarily get it. But the the message that we're getting about the coronavirus is that it's so contagious, so easily transferable. So how contagious is it? How easy is it really to get it? Well, there are two buckets of people, right? They're the people who don't know they have it and are mildly if no symptomatic. And I just talked to someone today who had an employee who didn't even know they had it, but they tested possible positive because they lived in a Westchester high risk area and they were tested. Well, that person could have gone out and, you know, uh, had a couple of coughs, you know, uh, you know, not knowing they were sick and infected many people. And that's what we worry about. You know, the flu and the cold, you know, when you have it, you know, you have to stay home, even though not everybody does. Um, but the problem with this is if you don't know you have it, you can spread it without knowing. And that's pretty scary. So how severe is it can run the gamut? Is that what that means? I mean, you could have it and it could just go away. So what, what should people take away from that? Well, most people, if you're under 55, you know, chances are this is gonna be mild to moderate symptoms and you'll get better pretty quickly. The problem is the elderly and the people with other medical conditions. So what, what we're really saying now is, that, hey, hey, listen, if you're a young person, you have to go through the same procedures as everybody else. But the main reason is we have to protect our community. We don't want somebody who's young to you know, get sick and infect an older person, a neighbor, a grandmother, uh, you know, a, another family member who may also have cancer. So we have to think about others and not just ourselves. This is a new era in public health. And you know, we have to think differently. So if someone is young, they don't have any underlying issues, they're not generally uh, around other elderly people or people with uh, serious underlying issues, should they be canceling air travel? Should they not be going to festivals? Should they be changing the way they operate at this point? That's a great question. So <laughs> there's no question to me is that, you know, air travel is one thing, festivals are another. Um, you know, air travel, the air on an airplane is circulated every four minutes and there's a HEPA filter that filters out viruses. The problem is, is that you're going from one place to another and there's a potential for spread there. Being in a concert with 100,000 people 
or a festival, that's a whole different story. You know, yesterday I was involved in canceling of the Indian Wells tennis tournament. Right. 500,000 people, a half a million people in one spot. We have one major hospital in the area that was full. So the problem is the medical infrastructure couldn't handle it. And if there was spread there or fear of spread, it would cause a panic. And so we had no choice but to do it. I do think for the next several weeks, you know, canceling large events makes sense. Large gatherings make sense until we can build the infrastructure to handle it, until we have medicines that have been shown to work and we have a supply of them, until we have our system ready to deal with it. Then it's a different story. You know, the data show that anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the U.S. population probably will be infected with this over the next several years. And the key is, though, that we do it over time, not all at once. Wow, 40 to 50 percent of the U.S. population. So then what's what's the percentage of the uh, the fatality rate or the people that would have it in a way that would be severe? Well, the issue is we don't know the denominator, right? In most parts of the world, including the United States, we are only testing people who are symptomatic and in hospitals. And so we don't know kind of that, that, that bottom number of the number of people infected because we're not testing... And remember, 80% of people are mild to no symptoms, so we're not testing them. So we need to know that, you know, true denominator to know that answer. My gut is the death rate, the fatality rate will be low if we had that real number. And my gut is as we have medications coming online, and there's several that are encouraging, that number will go even further down as they become available. So, you know, that's the hope part of it. But again, the goal now is to delay the spread of it so we can build the infrastructure to handle it. So I saw a doctor that seemed a legitimate local doctor that was quoted as comparing this to the pandemic flu. I don't even want to get into the numbers of the fatalities in that flu, but do you think that is a fair comparison? So I think you mean comparing it to 1918 where 60 to 80 million people in the world died. Um, You know, I think the viruses and their effects are rather similar. I think our medical infrastructure, our ability to quarantine and our understanding is dramatically better. So we're gonna have nowhere near those numbers of fatality. But still, if we don't really build the infrastructure and do this right, there could be, you know, hundreds of thousands to a million, you know, fatalities in the United States. And that obviously is worrisome. But I do think if we do this right and, you know, really uh, uh, limit the spread, especially in the near term, we're going to do a lot better as a society. And again, this is a different argument here. This is the people who are younger, you know, have to take care of the people who are older. We have to think about others rather than just ourselves. And we all have to work together as one community. So before I let you go, there's a lot of talk about making sure that people wash their hands. Sanitizers have run out at a lot of local stores. Do you think the message is about those sort of uh, precautions are overblown or is that really something to keep in mind? I think awareness is critical. Um, And so washing your hands with soap, remember there's plenty of soap out there. Soap works, hand sanitizers work. I think, you know, if you have any symptoms, self-quarantine or stay home. And that's really the critical one is that, you know, we're always taught, be tough. You have a little bit of symptoms, go to work. It's important to get your job done. We're a working society. We now have to say, if we have any symptoms, stay home. If we do that, we're going to have the best outcome as a country. And we're going to protect our elderly and the people with other medical conditions. And we have to, you know, protect each other. All right, Dr. Agus, always a pleasure. Thank you so much.